We have to put our track shoes on today. I am convinced we can catch up to where we belong to be, but we have some homework to do to get there. So we'll, we'll move more quickly than we have the last couple of weeks. But the good news is that the session we missed last week is really pretty um, economical in terms of what, what, what it covers. It just tells us all of the excuses we will find not to take this seriously. You all know those. I'm just going to rehearse them with you. Um, and then we'll move into today's lesson, which is today's and next week's. So I think we'll be in great shape. Any questions about the process so far, just for those who uh, may um, have, have stewed about it at some point during the last couple of weeks? Okay, we will begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We're currently um, trying to move through the um, information that... Uh, pull that shut behind you. Thanks, Sharon. Um, and um, according to my notes... By the way, this is a summary of what you probably could make no sense out of on the whiteboard. Um, so um, we'll refer to this from time to time as we move forward today. And we are on question number five in the first lesson. Um, how does our denominational background color who we are? Um, we talked about that a little bit together as, as um, we process some of the other questions. But what do you see as the major influence of the fact that this is Trinity Lutheran Church? Um, and most of you are traditionally Lutheran folk, or made the mistake of marrying one. <laughs> what does it mean that we're Lutheran? It's a commonality um, to our relationships and what we uh, what we believe, what we. Uh, Let me for. push you on that. You're right. What would you, if you had to pick one or two things that express that commonality, what would you say they are? The acceptance of uh, grace as being the primary component of our faith. Oh my goodness. Grace freaks. And anything else? Uh, service above self. common DNA that comes out of our denominational affiliation. Heritage. Heritage looking like what? Uh, white, Anglo-Saxon, German, Norwegian, Scandinavian, Northern Europe. Aryans. Yeah. <laughs> God, oh my with, God. with all of its baggage. Yeah, oh my goodness. I don't know that I spelled that right. Other, other aspects of our denominational heritage, as you um, hear them echo around in our gatherings, in our worship, in our um, study. We like music. We do like music. Yep. That's true. Have given Western culture some of its best music. That's exactly right. Other stuff. Liturgy. Yeah. Liturgy. Yeah, we don't have to ask every Sunday morning what shape the service ought to take. It's pretty well prescribed for us, as it is for our sisters and brothers in the Episcopal and uh, Roman Catholic traditions, and slightly differently in the Orthodox community. Um, actually, most churches have more liturgy than they would confess to. Um, Presbyterians, United Methodists, um, all of the Reformed traditions tend to have a format that they follow that is not unusual from Sunday to Sunday. It becomes a pattern a lot like ours. Ours just happens to be based on the more historic Western tradition that comes out of Rome. Anything else about what it means to be Lutheran that colors who we are, how we function, that you can think of? We 
be like you. Everyone loves Everyone loves I'm going to expand that one just, just slightly because I think while that's a kind of fun one to, to accent, um, it, it speaks to a somewhat larger piece. And that is that our Christian piety is not expressed by the kinds of um, what I would be tempted to call more superficial moralism that colors many Christian communities. So, um, um, the, the, you know, the, some, of the, some of the more conservative Christian communities who understand Christianity to be expressed by those who don't smoke or drink or say bad words. Um, it's a somewhat larger spectrum for us in terms of how we identify our piety and our moral commitments. And I think that's important for us to say. Anything else? The sacraments and especially the fact that we have uh, communion every week. Thank you. Right. We are a very sacramental church, um, as, as are our sister churches in the Western tradition. Um, that, that is to say, we, we celebrate communion every Sunday. Um, for us, baptism and communion are high holy days. We take them really seriously. Those, those are things that color who we are and how we function, I think, in a um, surprisingly strong way. The fact that it's an open communion as well. Ah, thank you. The sacraments as we understand them are God's sacraments, which means we are not the ones who set up the um, blockades. God invites all of God's children, and hopefully God's children respond. Um, I want to move on quickly if we don't have anything else, but I don't want to miss anything you might want to add to that. Thank you. What values and convictions drive the decisions we make as a congregation? We've always done it this way. Oh, wow. I'm not, I'm not going to sully tradition by assigning it to that <laughs> reality, but boy, that's true. Money. Money. Say more about that. Well, um, it seems like our budget is always controlled by what we think we will have rather than what we think we should do. That's a really well put concern. Say it loud. <laughs> our budget is based on what we think we will have rather than on what we think we could do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there, there are two different ways of looking at stewardship and um, mission and ministry. Uh, one of them says that like household budgets, we need to start with what our income is and pare down to adjust to that. Um, the other is to say we ought to reflect God's abundance and we ought to build out mission and ministry according to need, not according to our last year's receipts. So that's a real challenge, and it's one this congregation um, has turned into an art form over the years. <laughs> uh, so good to know. What else drives decisions here? I would hope Christ's example. Ah, I would hope too. <laughs> that's very good. Hopefully Christ's example influences what we do and why we do it. Exactly right. Anything else you want to add to that list? Those are, those are not unimportant. Um, it's, it's really um, part of the process is recognizing how the things that actually work among us compare to the things we confess work among us. And they are not always the same at all. That's true of every church. But it's really important to highlight the differences. What personality characteristics make this congregation unique? I, 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 I phrase it that way with real intention. But we all know that individuals have distinct particular, um, we might even say peculiar personalities. Um, 
the, the truth is, so do congregations. And it really helps to recognize the corporate personality we manifest, as best we can describe it. So what, what does the personality of Trinity Chesterfield, Trinity Town and Country, look like? What makes us literally unique? Got a whole lot of type A personalities. Ah, thank you. <laughs> take type A. I was reading yesterday. Uh, one of the things I'm doing uh, for the National Church is um, what's called um, genograms, which are the um, diagrams of emotional process in family systems or congregations. And one of the things that I read um, as I was um, doing some research um, was that type A personalities tend to be largely created by um, families that have um, extremely well articulated and highly placed expectations of their children. Um, and I think that's probably important for us to realize in a place like West County, uh, because uh, I think we've turned that too into an art form. We, we often have such high expectations and hopes for our children that uh, I, can, I continually worry that they'll feel like they need to retire when they graduate from college. Uh, so type A's, we, we, we really are a community with incredibly high expectations. I'd say relatively high levels of education and affluence. Yeah. Socioeconomic culture is um, is, is what we would call um, in American society, I think, um, at least upper middle class. People really strive for the most part. I think, I think that would be a safe description of, of most of the culture in which we live. Pat? I don't quite know how to say this, but we seem to have not everybody like this, but there seem to be groups of families, you know, that go generations. I don't know. Okay, so that's part of our personality is that we have many multi-generational families. Right. Okay, I think that's probably true. How many, how many of you in this room represent the second or third generation of your families? Not as many as I would have guessed. Yes. Two pieces here. One, I think, uh, what's unique about this congregation is a strong mission focus. Ah, thank you. And then second, uh, what's also unique about this congregation, or unique about the people attending the congregation, is we uh, many times tend to pay to have things done versus do them ourselves. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> those two observations you've just made because I think that I think that's a very interesting um, set of observations we're very concerned about mission um, we tend to prefer to have other people do much of the work that we would <coughs> in many parishes do ourselves how how do you balance it well the, the first is I think a true characteristic of Trinity when you look at the number of missions that are served either by Trinity itself or by the membership in yeah. Trinity. Yeah. Uh, whether it's LFCS or whether it's uh, LMA or, you know, there's just a, a, a bunch of those, right? Right. Um, the second is more um, tied to type A personality. It's more tied to the, our culture of, of affluent, uh, educated people Okay. that uh, will tend to, um, I, I'll give you an example.
example, that is a personal example. Uh, I'm not going to do a garage sale at my house. And I'll, I'll take my stuff and I'll take it to Goodwill. Right. But I'm not going to go yeah. through yeah. the effort okay. to put all gotcha. the stuff up and the tables in the garage sale right. and, 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 and do that. Yes, a garage sale is a big event here at Trinity yeah. uh, where you need hands and feet to do the garage sale. So that's contrasting um, our external maybe thought process and then how does that portray into um, service and mission. Okay, good, good, coming into good question. Church. Is it fair to say that we have a pretty focused definition of what we do well? and try to do those things mostly, and ask others to do things we may not think we do very well, or that we don't want to do particularly? Is that a, is that a fair um, way of looking at the larger picture? I mean, many of us have a passion for certain kinds of service that may not be in our wheelhouse, that we still do. But there are probably lots of things that need to be done that we'd rather have someone else do so we can focus on things we think we do better. Then that comes with affluence. That's exactly right. It's a really good thing to remember that many of our Christian sisters and brothers who are in um, religious communities, um, as, a, as a part of their commitment to the community, um, don't just pray and eat together and share um, wealth together, but they actually do ordinary work around the community, um, scrub the floors, Dig the garden, do pole barns. Yeah, um, exactly. Like that yeah. In rural communities. yeah. So it's 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 important to know that there are some places where that culture is different because the notion I think is that we stay a little more in touch with <laughs> earth and humility when we're doing some of the things we probably don't want to do. Uh, sometimes I think we think we have to reinvent the wheel too often. We have to start we start new projects and we forget that there are projects already going on, and then we're spread too thin. Thanks. That's one of the things that I think it's important for us to say as part of this process. Hopefully, what we're going to be doing um, to combine your comments and Larry's, um, we're, we're hopefully finding a way to funnel um, all of the stuff we're excited about and talking about and thinking about into a much narrower focus so that we say these are the things we think we're being called by God to do in this place at this time. And so we don't keep spinning off more and more things that we um, tend to um, stay on the surface rather than deepen. It seems to me but, there may be another way to look at what Larry and Pat were talking about, and that is we seem to be good with episodic Events. Okay. A garage sale, a pancake supper, an Oktoberfest, but in terms of missions or ministries that continue on, that need ongoing attention and people power, it's much more challenging to get people to step forward. Thank you. Regularity tends to get tedious. Maybe. Yeah. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, let's move on, if that's okay. Um, how do we understand and do the Great Commi uh, Commission? We all know what that is? And you want to remind us? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. Yeah. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, and baptize in Christ's name. That's, that's Matthew 28, 9, <coughs> somewhere. Um, how do we embody that? How do we carry that out? Yeah. <laughs> right <and check. laughs> we want to pay others to do that for us. <laughs> How else do we embody or live out of the Great Commission? Anybody? Mission trips. Mission trips? face. 
case and say you need to believe and you need to have faith. It's more, I'm going to have, I'm going to set an example and do things, and by my example, they people see my faith. Um, gotcha. Any other thoughts about that? Well, several years ago, I, I think we were really stressing the word evangelism. Right. And, um, you know, I thought, of, I didn't think exactly of that word, but when the idea came around that maybe Trinity should have a prayer service for these uh, violent deaths of the police officers and, and, and so forth, and um, I looked at it selfishly as saying, yeah, that might attract people to come to Trinity who, who, who never, who ignore us all the time. Well, a, a kind way would be saying that could be a form of evangelism. A selfish way that I was thinking of is, well, it, it might help our church. So I don't know if that, if that applies to this situation or not. Well put. I think both of those things get caught up together often among us. How many of you have, in one way or another, beyond your own children, um, uh, been concerned about and advocated for the baptism of someone who wasn't baptized? I bet many of you have. Uh, sometimes with really mixed feelings. <laughs> but I'll bet many of you have. It, and that's part of the Great Commission is part of what we're called to do. Um, I, I confess to you that a little like Ruth, I'm always worried about the mixed motives behind that, but I think that the Great Commission is really clear that that's one of the things we're supposed to do, encouraging others to be baptized in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Um, yes? Okay, we're gonna, mm -hmm. I can't see, so I didn't know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, I think it's harder today for people to go knocking on a door and invite people to church. Yeah. It's not what people do very much. Most of us don't like it when people knock on our doors. But I think with, with Larry that we prefer to do it by example, the way we live, the way we treat people, invitational to them, but not in your face kind of thing. I, mm -hmm. I think it's just harder. Thank you. I, I think you're right. I think that word has gotten some really bad press, well-deserved yeah. over the years. So that evangelism sounds like trying to drag people kicking and screaming to something they don't want to do. And, and I think it, in, in, in terms of being a way of talking about the good news of Jesus Christ, this is one of those things that ought to be an invitation joyfully delivered and received. But we haven't ever been very good at figuring out how to make that happen. Um, yes, Dick. I think our efforts in this field tend to be, I don't know how to put it, under the radar. Okay. Um, we, we, we do things and we probably, uh, hopefully by example, as Larry says, right. live out an evangelical life. Right. But there's nothing um, overt about what we do. We don't publicize what we do. Yeah. It's all kind of low key. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else before we move on? Under the radar. What sins and sin patterns have we been delivered from? <laughs> All of them. Well put. Uh, <laughs> All of them. Are there particular ones that seem per, that, that seem to be peculiar to us here at Trinity? Pride. Pride?
sometimes individualism over and above um, common uh, good, if you could put it that way. We have our individual likes and dislikes and we tend to cling to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we tend, we tend to think of ourselves as sort of siloed Christians in, in many ways rather than as a corporate body. Um, I think that's a little harder for us to imagine. What motivates, uh, did you, were you going yeah, to? I just had a question. Please. Um, I haven't been here in 30 years, I was going to work here, but uh, is this a united church or is this a divided congregation? About <laughs> <laughs> <Not> what? Issues <laughs> <laughs> in general. I, I think that there are many things about which we are united. I think there are many things about which we are divided. Okay. Um, we could probably make a list of each of those and maybe should at some point, but it's a great question. <clears throat> what motivates our mission and church life? What's behind it? What's the why of what we do? Scripture. And let me push you on that, Dave. What, we, we, don't, we don't enforce leave or right marriage. <laughs> no, we don't. So, <laughs> we don't enforce all of Scripture. How do we choose what Scripture motivates us? Do you all know what that is? No. Leave or right marriage? What? Oh, gee, you're missing most of the fun. Um, <laughs> leave or right marriage is an Old Testament law in which if your brother died before he impregnated his wife, it is your job to do that. Um, the family is responsible for giving women offspring who will economically provide for their survival. If we still did that, you'd be much more careful about the families you married into. <laughs> so we don't enforce all of scripture. And, and, and so it's, I think it's really important to ask for, for us, script, I think scripture is the motivation behind a lot of what we do. How do we decide what scripture? What do we look to? How do we, how do we sort? What, for Lutherans, how do we say what's the important part of scripture, I guess, is either one of the questions. I, I'm not sure I would categorize this as just Lutherans, but Trinity, I think, is very gospel focused. And say what that means as you understand it. Less focused on law and conscience. Uh -huh. And more focused on what we talked about earlier, grace, freaks, and faith. Good. Thank you. I think that's true. Anybody else? I'm sorry? I heard something back there. Um, when, when we used to examine seminarians um, on a regular basis and ask them how they prioritized what they understood scripture to say. One of the things we always listened carefully for was an understanding that, as Luther teaches, what scripture primarily provides to those of us in the Lutheran confessional tradition is the, um, Luther put it this way, what drives Christ like a hammer drives a nail, what drives Christ is central to what the scriptures offer. So that those things that make the goodness, the grace, the gospel of Jesus apparent and real are central in the scripture. Those things that try to suggest it's our behavior that makes us acceptable to God, Luther would say, are far less valuable as we interpret the scriptures. Um, it isn't the litmus test that works for everything, but it works for a number of things. Please. Our mission statement, or whatever you call it, yeah. you matter to God, you matter to us. I don't think we always live it that way, but that's what we believe in. Thank you. I think that's right. And, and I... Uh, unlike many congregations, I think most of you at least know that phrase and can recite it. Oftentimes that's not true of, of congregational 
um, statements. Thank you all. Anything else before we move on? Since we're up there on the board, and I think it's under that first line, is that we really do have a lot of education going on in this congregation from preschool all the way up there. Up here? Probably. Yeah, we do a lot more teaching as a church than some churches do. And different teaching than some churches, both of those things. Okay. I think that's right. I think that does attract people who want to use their brain in their faith more than others. Um, if you'll turn over really quickly to um, what should have been last week. There, there's a list here of things that are obstacles to the process we're in. And I just want to say a word about those. I'm not even going to read them all to you. I'm going to ask you to read them. There are many of those which I think we are great to as a congregation. Things that say um, we shouldn't take so seriously what we're doing, including our um, lack of digestion of the things like this we've done in the past. But um, the, the, many of these um, describe us. Um, per perhaps less than in some previous year's ministry treadmill. Um, but too busy to think. The competency trap. We think we're smarter than other people and therefore we don't need to learn from them. Um, the needs-based slippery slope, that is to say, we pay attention, as married couples often do, to the shopping list of the day and not to larger questions and issues. Um, the cultural whirlpool, um, a church that is um, addicted to whatever is new, whatever is novel, whatever is recent. Um, the um, cultural whirlpool of a stuck church, that is to say we're unable to think about the future, um, too worn out to imagine new things. Um, the conference um, whirlpool, that is to say um, you can often tell um, what what um, professional conference the preacher's been to last, because that's the thing that um, the newsletter and um, the educational stuff talks about for the next few months until the next conference. Um, and there's not really any consistency or follow through. And finally, the denominational rut, where we just sort of do what they tell us to. Um, all of those are real, all of those are powerful and can get in our way. Many of those are typical of us. Um, I just want to have named them so that when we need to refer back to them, we can. Now, this week and next, um, if you'll turn to uh, weeks three and four, July 24 and 31st, discovering Trinity's kingdom concept. This is made up of three particular parts. Um, I draw those circles on the board, but you have them in front of you, so that's kind of silly. Um, there are three really important issues, and where they intersect is where we want to focus in our conversations next week. One of those is, what is our local predicament? That is to say, what is unique and different and important about the fact that we're right here at the intersection of Clayton Road and 141? We're the only church in this spot. What's needing ministry in the ripples that go out from this spot that no other congregation may be nearly so well placed to care about or respond to? That's really the first question. Are you clear about that? We're not limited to walking distance from the church. But it used to be that, that parishes were defined by their boundaries Many Roman Catholic parishes still are. Louisiana is geographically and politically organized that way. Um, on Ascension Day, I love this story, on Ascension Day, parishes used to take their catechism children and make them walk the perimeter of the boundaries of their parish and whip them at each corner so that they remembered where the parish was responsible for. Um, isn't that a fascinating story? Um, you know, we couldn't get ours to walk that far, let alone to, to, to put up with a, a switching at the corners. But um, the, the notion is that the parish we're settled in is uniquely our responsibility. 
Where we live may also be our responsibility, and that's a much broader circle. But I think it's really important to say, what is it nearby that we should be paying attention to that maybe we haven't thought about? That's the first question. Any questions about that question? Second question. Um, what is our collective potential? What are the skills, the abilities, um, the um, capacities, um, the spiritual gifts that, that are collected here in the life of this community? And how can they respond to those things? Get the question? Mm -hmm. And then finally, what is, um, Mancini doesn't usually fall into techno talk, but he does here. Um, what is the apostolic esprit of this congregation? That is to say, um, uh, the Bible talks about uh, spiritual gifts and, and, um, and callings. Um, we talked a little bit about that the last time. What is it unique to Trinity? How do we describe collectively what it is God has gifted us with as a congregation that um, becomes our calling or our sense of what's particular about our calling? Do you understand the question? It's a much tougher one to grasp because we don't often talk like that. But I want to I want to um, lay that out there for us to think about. So those are the three pieces. We're going to try to see what they are next week and how they intersect. Um, you've got a bunch of questions. I'd like you to look at ahead of time, if you would, because we'll move through them much more quickly if you've already given them some thought. But this is where the rubber starts to get the road for us. And I, and I hope you'll spend some time really digging into this as we move forward. Ruth. No? OK. Questions, anybody? Uh, re uh, restate your definition of that apostolic screen. Sure. Um, what is um, what is our calling? What are our spiritual gifts? What has God asked of us? What is God asking of us in this place that there's no one else to do? size of the uh, children and youth group in this, in this uh, congregation as far as uh, is it thriving? Is it the, the younger children is a community that's growing right. and becoming um, more viable. Youth group doesn't exist. Okay. See, now, when I was here, that's all my friends, sure. lifetime friends, all that all came from this church. Yeah. And yep. that's a real... It's a huge deal. Huge deal. 